They've seen birds in the sky flying. They've seen the insects buzzing along. And there we are, that's man, rooted to the floor. Icarus and his father, they tried to fly. And they got feathers and they attached them to their arms with wax. Yeah, you remember. Go on, can you remember the story? He, he, they got up in the air and he said, don't go to the sun because the wax will melt. And what happened to the wax? It melted. It melted. What happened to the feathers? They fell off. They fell off. What happened to Icarus? He died. He did. On July the 12th, 1910, Charles Rolls, the co-founder of Rolls-Royce, was killed when a plane that he was flying plummeted into the ground at an air display. Together with his close friend, J.T. Seymour Brabazon, Charles Rolls had been a pioneer of flying in Britain. The place that the two men had chosen as a site for their flying experiments was the Isle of Sheppey in Kent. It's extraordinary that so few people seem to know about the pioneering work that went on here. Moore Brabazon became the first Briton to fly in Britain at Muswell Manor, just a few miles over there. It's a holiday camp now. And Charlie Rolls taught himself to fly at that low hill just coming into view on the left. Everybody knows about Louis Blériot and the Wright brothers. But Charlie Rolls was the first person to fly over the channel both ways. And nobody pays attention to him. That hill is part of a prison complex now. In the village of Eastchurch is an impressive monument to Sheppey's pioneer aviators. Normally, this memorial goes almost unnoticed. But this is 2009, the centenary of aviation in Britain. Exactly 100 years ago, on Sheppey, Moore Brabazon became the first Briton to fly in Britain. And here, the Short brothers produced a remarkable range of flying machines, including some of the earliest seaplanes. Charles Rolls wasn't the only aviator who flew from here to lose his life. But few of these men are remembered today. They came from all over the country. All they had in common was a burning desire to fly. It was that desire that brought them here to Sheppey. Why did they come to the Isle of Sheppey? Anybody know? Because there's lots of ground and grass. Right, lots of ground and grass. Because there's no buildings on it. No buildings on it. So that part of Sheppey was pretty desolate, wasn't it? Not a lot of buildings crash into it. Yes, please. Is it because it's got like quite a lot of hills? Because there are quite a lot of hills, or there's not? No, because there is. Because there is. There are a few low hills on Sheppey. But more Brabazon's first flight took place over this field at Laysdown, and it was certainly its flatness that recommended it. The earliest aviators didn't have enough control over their machines to avoid obstructions. Luckily, the first aeroplanes flew so slowly and so close to the ground that although there were frequent crashes, none of them were fatal. It was this unassuming building, Muswell Manor, that brought the early pioneers here. In 1909, Muswell Manor was the clubhouse for the Aero Club. And it was outside its front door, two days after Moore Brabazon's first flight, that a famous photograph was taken. It's known as the Founding Fathers and is a virtual who's who of early British aviation. In the front row, between Moore Brabazon on the left and Charles Rolls on the right sit the two brothers who started it all, Wilbur and Orville Wright. Can you hear me? A hundred years later, the present owners of Muswell Manor 
are celebrating the photograph's centenary. If you wish to have a picture taken at the door, there's a commissioned photographer here. So if you wish to have your picture taken here afterwards, you're more than welcome to. OK? And I'm just going to go and find Lord Brotherson. Rolls-Royce? Rolls-Royce? Yes, yeah, somebody from Rolls-Royce. Excellent. Rolls-Royce is the bottom right. Well, I'm wearing a Royal Air Club tie. Many people with early aviation connections are here including Moore Brabazon's grandson. Where you are, you guess, how are that? This is where you were a hundred years ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take your word for it. The present Lord Brabazon takes his place in the recreation of the original photograph. They just keep flashing with that thing. It does work every now and again. Among the day's ceremonies is the unveiling of Muswell Manor's new front door, reconstructed just as it was a hundred years ago. Very much indeed. It's a very great pleasure to be here, and I do think it's absolutely wonderful the way you've restored this door, out of which I imagine my grandfather came almost exactly a hundred years ago this weekend to make the first flight in this country by an Englishman. When the Wright brothers came to Muswell Manor in 1909, they were two of the most famous people in the world. Ten years earlier, they had been virtually unknown. But they had become convinced that man could fly and that the glide of the bird was the key to flight. Some of the very first attempts at making a machine that would fly would be something that looks like that on the screen. It looks like a bird. And there's the, the chap there, look, see his head, and there's his feet into some stirrups. It's called an ornithopter. You got inside and you had a mechanism so that the stirrups were attached to the wings. And if you pedaled your feet, the wings started going up and down. Then the idea was that maybe if you pedaled fast enough, that the wings would flap and you would lift off the floor. There were many variations on the ornithopter design. None of them worked. Through the 1890s, Wilbur Wright, with his younger brother Orville, had been running a bicycle manufacturer and repair business from his father's house in Dayton, Ohio. By 1899, the business was prospering. But the brothers' creative talents were not fully stretched. Wilbur became interested in the idea of manned flight. Finding that his younger brother and business partner Orville was equally enthusiastic, Wilbur wrote to the Smithsonian Institution. He asked them for a reading list that might advance his knowledge. The Smithsonian wrote back with several suggestions. Two in particular caught Wilbur's eye. The first was bird flight as a basis of aviation by the German Otto Lilienthal. At the Royal Aeronautical Society, Brian Riddle has a treasured copy. This is the first edition of Otto Lilienthal's book. Wow. Which was originally published in Berlin, 1889. And it's basically a study of bird flights. And it was his studies of birds that led him to produce his series of gliders. Right. Uh, they're effectively the precursor of the modern hang glider. Mm -hmm. And he built effectively his own launching hill in Germany. And he completed hundreds and hundreds of flights with these. Their bat construction, if you like, the whole design of them seems to have the ribs going out rather like a bat's wings. Lilienthal's experiments were recorded in a series of remarkable photographs, the first to show a man in flight in a heavier-than-air machine. He died in 1896. His gliders are stalled, mm -hmm. um, and he fell to his death.
Lilienthal was really the first of the main European pioneers whose work made a great impact on people who were interested in yes. aeronautics. And the Wrights studied this work in detail. Another recommendation from the Smithsonian Institution was a book called Progress in Flying Machines by a French-born American engineer, Octave Chanute. He was a civil engineer and he'd made a lot of money out of developing the railroad system around Chicago, mm. where he was based. But he also got interested in the engineering problem of a mechanical flying machine. To begin with, Chanute emulated Lilienthal's batwing glider design. But soon, he adopted a biplane model, the two rectangular wings joined by a strut system. He also set himself to gather and summarize the current state of aeronautical research and published it in the magazine Aeronautics and subsequently in his book, Progress in Flying Machines. It's effectively a compendium of the state of knowledge at that time on aeronautics. Yes. And he was one of the people who the Wrights contacted when they were gathering their information to do their own experiments. He seems very open. In, in the way that he passes information between different experimenters. Mm. He seemed to correspond with everybody. And soon, Wilbur too was writing to Octave Chanute. For some years, I've been afflicted by the belief that flight is possible to man. My disease has increased in severity, and I feel that it will soon cost me an increased amount of money, if not my life. A warm friendship developed between Chanute and the two Wright brothers. After consulting with him and the US Weather Bureau, they chose Kitty Hawk in North Carolina as the site for their experiments. Where they were is like a very bleak landscape, middle yeah, of nowhere. Absolutely, you know, there's photographs that just show their little hut mm. and it just looks like it's in the desert. By the end of 1900, the brothers had constructed a series of gliders, which they operated as kites controlled from the ground, making careful notes of their performance. In Europe, many people thought that balloons were the way forward. Attach an engine to a balloon, conventional wisdom had it, and you had an airship capable of sailing round the world. But it was not until the development of the internal combustion engine in the last decades of the 19th century that engines began to be sufficiently light and efficient. It took the imagination of a young lad in Brazil, obsessed with the novels of Jules Verne, to work out how to design a successful powered balloon. But Alberto Santos Dumont had to wait until he was grown up and living in Paris before he could make his dreams a reality. Then, Santos Dumont designed a series of powered cigar-shaped balloons. In one of these, he won the prize offered by the Aero Club of France for a 30-minute circular flight between saint Cloud and the Eiffel Tower. In Britain, a rich old Etonian, Charles Rolls, was as impressed by Santos Dumont's exploit as were the people of Paris. Rolls was already a keen motorist, taking part in time trials and races throughout Europe. But Charles Rolls was also passionate about balloons. Charlie was a great balloonist. He'd got several balloons. And he had a young friend, Vera Hedges Butler. And Vera had a car, and she was going to take her father, Frank Hedges Butler, out for a ride on a Sunday. And Vera had a leak in her petrol tank on the Saturday, so she got hold of Charlie and said, do you think you could take my father up in one of your balloons? And as soon as they get airborne at Sidcup, 
they start talking about the wondrous epic voyage of Santos Dumont in France under the auspices of the French Aero Club. And they are absolutely amazed at this feat. And uh, they decide that, in fact, we need to have an aero club rather like the French have an aero club to do the same sort of job and furthering the interests of aviation. And when they formed that club, the founding honorary member was Santos Dumont. Meanwhile, the Wright gliding experiments continued in the seclusion of Kitty Hawk. By October 1902, they had made hundreds of perfectly controlled flights. But an earlier visit to their camp by their friend Octave Chanute threatened their privacy. Chanute was not famous for his discretion. Octave Chanute was an incredible correspondent. He seemed to correspond with everybody, with all the people around the world who were interested in aeronautics. And he seems to have written letters like we write emails. Mm. Back in Dayton, the Wright set to work to design their first powered flying machine. They built a lightweight 12 horsepower motor and researched the best design for their propellers. The body of the aircraft was made of spruce, strong and light. The twin propellers of three layers of spruce glued together. It had a forward elevator, a double rudder and a skid undercarriage. The Wright's first powered machine, the Wright Flyer, cost less than a thousand dollars to build. In September 1903, they took it to Kitty Hawk and assembled it. After months of delay with mechanical problems and bad weather, they were finally ready to test it on the 14th of December. But the flyer, with Wilbur at the controls, plowed into the sand immediately after takeoff and had to be repaired. It was not until December the 17th that the brothers tried again. They made four successful flights of successively longer duration, the last covering over 850 feet history had been made. When they landed, after 59 seconds, they were very keen on congratulating each other. And whilst they did that, the aeroplane blew away. But though Orville and Wilbur had succeeded in making one of mankind's most cherished dreams a reality, mankind was remarkably slow in acknowledging their achievement. They had very great trouble convincing the world that they could fly. Even in American newspapers, the Wright's flight was hardly headline news. In Britain, it was even more difficult to spot. Among the few who were aware of it were Charles Rolls and his young friend Brab, John Theodore Cuthbert Moore Brabazon. Charlie and Brab were both keen members of the Aero Club. And when Charlie Rolls proudly demonstrated the first Rolls-Royce to the Duke of Connaught, it was Brab, in chauffeur's uniform, who coaxed the engine into life. Both men were well aware of the significance of the news from Kitty Hawk. Soon, they were themselves testing model gliders from the balconies of the Royal Albert Hall. In France, the Wright brothers' accomplishment had a sensational impact. Many Frenchmen refused to believe it. Others threw themselves into the effort to catch up. In 1905, Gabriel Voisin, in association with Louis Blériot, tested a glider on the River Seine, which managed to become airborne for several seconds towed by a launch. The Wrights were already building on their earlier success. Their flights at Kitty Hawk had all been short and in a straight line. They needed to be able to turn, fly circles and figures of eight, and control their machine perfectly in the air. 
when they started at Huffman Prairie at the beginning of 1904, they needed to do a great deal of work on the aeroplane before it was something that could be called a saleable commercial aeroplane. Huffman Prairie was a flat, boggy pasture a few miles from the Wright's Dayton home. The Wright's new flyer was sturdier, heavier, and with an entirely new engine. After two years of development at Huffman Prairie, they at last had a reliable, maneuverable aircraft capable of sustained flight. By October 1905, they'd done 24 miles in 39 minutes and proved the aeroplane really perhaps as far as they could take the design at that stage. And so, yes, they put it in the hangar. Amazingly, the brothers were to make no more flights for two and a half years. But they weren't idle. Negotiations with American, British, French and German governments were opened, but founded either because the price was too high or because the brothers refused to demonstrate their machine before a contract was signed. But Wilbur remained optimistic. We do not believe there is one chance in a hundred that anyone will have a machine of the least practical usefulness within five years. But in France, the Wright's rivals were catching up. Santos Dumont réussit le 7 septembre. On 7th September 1906, Santos Dumont flies for one second. On 13th September, he goes over 10 meters. On 23rd October, 50 meters. In March 1907, Charles Vossin makes a flight of 80 meters in a biplane built by his brother, Gabriel. Meanwhile, attempts throughout Europe seem destined only to fail. In Britain, there was hope of a breakthrough in an entirely different direction, kiting. The British Army believed that a man carrying kite as an aid to battlefield reconnaissance was a practical proposition and invited a flamboyant American to help them develop it. Samuel Franklin Cody. His real name was actually Codery, not Cody. And he changed his name to Cody so that he could be associated with the more famous Buffalo Bill Cody and the Wild West Circus. Samuel Cody had very real abilities as a horseman and marksman, which he used to good effect in a circus act which toured the music halls and fun fairs of Edwardian Britain. But he was also fascinated by kites and had in 1903 managed to cross the channel in a boat towed by a series of kites. Now, this unlikely man became the British Army's kiting instructor. It looks a bit like an aeroplane, doesn't it? And, and there are, above this, more kites, aren't there, in order to provide the lift to lift this chap here in his basket. And you can see Cody doing his stuff, flaunting his dress in a very flamboyant way, not only as a circusman and a cowboy, but also as an aeronautical genius. That was the impression he liked to give. Surprisingly, the army got on well with Cody. They were soon employing him to help build what was hoped to be the first British Army aeroplane. With the American and British governments apparently out of the reckoning as purchasers of the Wright Flyer, Wilbur took himself off to Paris in the hope of concluding a deal with the French. But again, negotiations stalled. Disgusted by the suggestion that a little well-placed bribery might speed up the business, Wilbur whiled away the time sightseeing in the French capital, taking care to reassure his father that its more notorious night spots held no delights for him. In early 1908, Henri Farman made the first officially recorded one-kilometer circuit in a Boisard biplane. This feat was greeted with delight by the French public and the press. It seemed that the Wright's chance had gone. 
but at last their persistence paid off. By spring 1908, they had two deals in place. One with a syndicate of French businessmen, the other with the US Signal Corps. After a short spell in Kitty Hawk to practice with their new machine, Wilbur sailed back to France to demonstrate it. And Orville prepared to give a similar demonstration to the United States Army. As Wilbur prepared for his first exhibition flight in France in August 1908, he was faced with skepticism and not a little derision. Some newspapers called him a bluffer. His French rivals, Fermin, Latham and Blériot, were all making successful flights. Wilbur had had little practice on the new two-seater Wright Flyer. He had had to practically rebuild the machine after it had been carelessly repacked by French customs officials and had been badly scalded while testing the engine. Nonetheless, his preparations were meticulous. His first flight was a mere two circuits of the field and lasted less than two minutes. But his ability to maneuver his machine and bring it effortlessly to land amazed the onlookers. His demonstrations of the right A in France far surpassed what anybody else had done in aviation up to that time. And the right suddenly became from uh, total unknowns in Dayton, Ohio, became well yeah. celebrities. Everybody wanted access to them, particularly to their machine. Throughout August, aviation enthusiasts, members of the aristocracy and journalists queued to be taken up by Wilbur in his wonderful new aeroplane. Charles Rolls was still organizing ballooning events alongside Brab at his home in Monmouthshire. But ever since he had met the Wrights during a Rolls-Royce marketing trip in 1906, he longed to fly one of their machines. Now, he lost no time in sailing over to France with other members of the Aero Club. Just as they hoped, Wilbur agreed to take Griffith Brewer, Frank Hedges Butler and Charles Rolls up, one by one, for a trip in his plane. It was a life-changing experience. Griffith Brewer described his feelings on making his first powered flight. There was a feeling of elation when the grass slipped away backwards and downwards and the machine seemed to be sitting on nothing. The predominant sense was one of wonder that the same man could calmly invent such a mechanism and yet fly it with such consummate skill. Charles Rolls, when his turn came, was overwhelmed by the experience. He was more than ever convinced that he must get the concession to build Wright Flyers in Britain. Meanwhile, Brab had gone off in a different direction altogether. It was only Farman's flight in a Voisin machine at the beginning of the year that caught his imagination. Now he decided to go over to France and introduce himself to the Voisin brothers and learn to fly one of their machines. Brab was a fast learner. Soon, he was making his first flight in France in a Voisin biplane. Loneliness, instability, uncertainty, the knowledge that no one in the whole world could help you, these were the sensations that made my heart beat faster. On his return from France, Griffith Brewer started to search out suitable sites for a flying field. One of his balloon flights took him over Laysdown in Sheppey. The ground is in every way suitable for the purpose, and an uninterrupted flight of over 10 miles in a straight line may be obtained, with a considerable expanse of country for circling. It's very accessible from London, and members of the Aero Club will find good accommodation in the charming old house known as Muscle Manor. 
Meanwhile, Charles Rolls paid a visit to Battersea, where two young brothers, Oswald and Eustace Short, had a balloon manufacturing business in the railway arches conveniently close to the gas works. Oswald, in the flat cap, often used to go down to Monmouth to supervise Rolls' balloon flights. Charles Rolls now tried to persuade the two brothers to go into the manufacture of aeroplanes. Eustace Short, like Oswald, was an excellent engineer, but neither brother knew how to build a powered flying machine. But there was another brother, Horace. Horace had never thought much of his brother's balloon manufacturing enterprise. He thought balloons were nasty, useless and dangerous contraptions, and described Eustace and Oswald as balloon mad. But aeroplanes were an entirely different matter. Horace was an engineering genius. Some people say he had two brains. He certainly had a very much enlarged head. He'd suffered meningitis as a child and survived it. And this left him with this greatly enlarged head and quite marvelous uh, intellectual capacity. From now on, Horace's remarkable intellect was devoted to the design of flying machines. The brothers decided to build their new aircraft factory at Shell Beach, just across the fields from the Aero Club's new clubhouse at Muswell Manor. The quaint, old world air of the clubhouse contrasts curiously with the new corrugated iron workshops which Messrs Harbro have erected about half a mile away for Short Brothers. It seems permissible to say that Shell Beach is the birthplace of a new industry. Here, on the Isle of Sheppey, aviation in Britain was born. But first, there were a few formalities to be concluded. A lease had to be negotiated with Joseph Andrews, the owner of Muswell Manor. His granddaughter, the well-known sculptor Faith Winter, remembers him well. He bought 2,000 acres of land at Laysdown with the idea of making it into a beautiful holiday resort. There was nobody else here, there was nothing at Shell Beach. It hasn't changed an awful lot, not as much as one would think. It hasn't really, it hasn't. I mean, this is all still lovely and green. When I was about three, I suppose I was starting to register aeroplanes and things like that. You couldn't miss them. They buzzed about all over the place all the time. This was our playground, and the aeroplanes taking off the buildings, that, the corrugated iron, where I know that when you went inside and spoke, it all sort of echoed. It was just lovely. That We loved it best in the winter, because in the summer it was very crowded, and we had it all to ourselves in the winter. I loved it here in the winter. It was exciting, it was empty and the wind blew, and it was exhilarating. I think in retrospect, this, was, this is my favourite place. Hundreds of people have gathered here to celebrate the birth of British aviation at Muswell Manor. Central to Laysdown celebrations is a play based on early aviation stories performed by Big Fish, a Sheppey-based theatre company led by Jeff Reed and his wife Chris. I did a little bit of amateur dramatics. We had a street band, we did street theatre. Then we started concentrating not just on drama and music but also aspects of the heritage of the Isle of Sheppey, the history. The centenary of aviation came up and 
we were invited to do a community play and um, Jeff came up with the idea of putting the music hall songs into the community play. Champagne Charlie is my name and aviation is my game. Increasingly I've been into schools doing drama workshops and it's interesting that young people very often have got no idea of that history is on their doorstep. And one of the things that I wanted to do was to get them to think of well, the excitement of flight. The Short Brothers' commitment to build aircraft on the Isle of Sheppey was a journey into the unknown. But in the early months of 1909, they had two pieces of good news. First, the Wright brothers gave them a contract to build six Wright flyers at Shell Beach. And secondly, Brab, J.T. Seymour Brabazon, decided to bring his French-built bird of passage across from France and join them. The life down at Sheppey was rather a strange one. The accommodation was not very good but the Short family were ideal folk to live with and to experiment with. Horace had an extraordinary grasp of every scientific department of life. Some of the happiest days I ever spent were with this remarkable man. Brab's first flight in Britain was not long delayed. Later, it would be seen as a milestone in Britain's aviation history but it nearly ended in disaster. The flight was not a very long one, and nor was it very high, perhaps 50 feet. While in the air, I was suddenly struck by a powerful gust of wind. I discovered, to my horror, that the control to the rudder had broken. The machine pitched forward and sideways, the ground spun below me, and suddenly I struck the ground heavily on the tip of the left-hand wing. Wires and struts snapped viciously, and the engine left its moorings and came hurtling through the air from behind me, missing me by inches. I recovered to find myself being licked by my two dogs, who had chased after me during the flight. What we're witnessing today is an incredible achievement, and sadly a forgotten incredible achievement. 100 years ago today, fixed-wing aviation in Britain started. We're here to celebrate the centenary of 100 years of flying in Britain. People don't know that it actually started here, not at Farnborough or anywhere else. And also it started the British aircraft industry. An embryo aircraft industry, the Short Brothers were started. Being on the same field, I mean, we're the same type of pilots as they are, you know, by guess and by gosh, one strap across our lap just a bar in front of us and we looked down over two or three or 10,000 feet. They never looked over that height. They basically flew at 100 or 200 feet. But we're like them and so there's a very strong symbiotic link between us and those original pioneers. It is an amazing day. Everybody in Kent should be very proud of this. This is a national, if not an international, heritage centre. It's so important that these sort of landmarks are actually preserved because it is the cradle of aviation here in, in, on the island of Sheppard. Two days after Brab's first flight, Orville and Wilbur Wright, chauffeured by Charles Rolls, visited the Short's Shell Beach factory to be shown around by Horace in his trademark baggy hat. But as the Wrights were giving the new factory their seal of approval, two Frenchmen were competing to be the first to fly across the channel. Hubert Latham made his attempt on the 19th of July, but was forced to ditch his Antoinette monoplane in mid-channel. Louis Blériot tried a week later, in spite of an injured foot. But Hubert Latham was planning another attempt. There was no time to lose.
plus heureux que la TAM. Luckier than La Tham, he lands at Dover after flying 38 kilometers in 32 minutes. Less than a week after Blériot's exploit, Charles Rolls took a short-built glider onto Stanford Hill at East Church and set about teaching himself to fly. At the same time, Brab was getting to know his new shorts-designed aeroplane, on which he would attempt the first circular mile in a British-built machine. Shell Beach was a hive of activity. Here, among other machines, half a dozen Wright flyers are being built. As far as the framework is concerned, some of them are already complete. Few people can have any conception of how busy Short Brothers have been these last few months. But the mere fact that they're employing about 80 men is at least proof that they're taking their work seriously. At the Great Aviation Meeting at Wallace in August, Wilbur and some of his French pupils made some impeccable flights. But now, only a year after his sensational first flights in France, there was a whole range of different aircraft in the skies. As Charles Rolls was taking delivery of his shorts-built Wright flyer, there were already suggestions that the Wrights were no longer the leaders in their field. The Wright flyer seemed at the time to have reached the end of its design capacity. The elevator was at the front, and it was rather an unstable way of controlling an aeroplane, and it, from then on, really, they favoured the farming style with uh, his elevator and, and fins there at the back. Finally, Henri Farman carries two passengers for the first time and wins the Grand Prix de Champagne. By the end of the RAS meeting, according to many commentators, it was Henri Farman's machine that was the leading biplane of the day. And it was in the Short Brothers' first effort to move away from the Wright's design that Brab, in October, won the prize for the first circular mile in an all-British machine. A few days later, he took a pig up in a basket to celebrate and to prove that pigs really could fly. But all was not well at Shell Beach. The airfield was crisscrossed by a network of ditches which took their toll of unwary aviators. Broken machines had to be hauled back to the airfield by cart horse, which might take hours. Reluctantly, the Short Brothers relocated to East Church, which was to be their base until the outbreak of war in 1914. From this site, Horace, with his immense energy, drove the company forward with a stream of inventions that were to revolutionize military and civil aviation in Britain and abroad. One of Short's more remarkable machines was an aeroplane they built for Lieutenant Dunn. Lieutenant John William Dunn decided he would try to design an inherently stable aeroplane in which you could lock the controls in the air and then you could send your note down to the ground telling the people on the ground what you could see. And that really was the first aeroplane that could take off like that and where you could let go of the controls. Just simply a flying wing. Dunn's ideas were decades ahead of their time. It's quite un unlike anything else that was being designed Absolutely, at the time. Absolutely, completely unlike. And then it wasn't really until the B-2 stealth bomber mm. uh, that, that it became <clears throat> you know, very much kind of popularised. And it was quite a remarkable design. And in many ways you could say he designed the modern aeroplane. Later, Dunn's flying wing was licensed both to the United States and to the French Neopol company. Commandant Felix delivered a prototype to France. Perhaps East Church's greatest popular triumph was the Gordon Bennett International Air Race, which was held there in July 1911. A crowd of 10,000 gathered on Stanford Hill to watch a number of famous aviators put their machines through their paces. The editor of Flight Magazine enthused the whole event must be written down a success from first to last. But Charles Rolls was not among the competitors at East Church. Rolls had gone from strength to strength in his right flyer, 
winning the Solomon Trophy at the end of 1909 and setting a British duration record not long after. And in June 1910, he made the first non-stop double crossing of the English Channel, starting from Dover. The flight made Rolls a national hero. But by 1910, Charles Rolls was one of the few remaining enthusiasts for the Wright Flyer in Europe. In an effort to make its control easier, he had added a rear stabilizing plane. His friend Brab was watching as he tried a maneuver at the Bournemouth Air Show. Charlie came over the grandstand rather high so as to avoid an accident in case his engine stalled. And he had to dive very sharply to get down to the mark. This maneuver went all right, but he pulled out of it too quickly, with the result that he broke his stabilizing plane at about 40 feet above the ground. Momentarily, the machine seemed to stop in the air. Then it dropped its nose and dived vertically, Charlie actually falling out of the machine. He had not got a mark on his body, but he has broken his neck. This terrible disaster to aviation and the loss of so dear a friend sickened me, and I never flew again until the war. <laughs>